الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين um, so i wanted to just kind of pick up from last week where we were we had started with some questions so normally i do the questions at the end but i want to flip it so open it up for questions right now pretty much if they're related to the series of lectures that that we've been having here on the friday night halaqa for men <coughs> parenting, mentoring, and so forth. Um, and, and then I had some actually questions for, for you. So it's, the floor is now open for you for questions. Yes. I wasn't here last time. Okay. been on your mind for a while for okay a few weeks a few weeks ago you mentioned a story where uh, i think imam malik his student his uh, very learned student had a dream mm -hmm. and he he saw somebody in his dream uh, and he asked that person that how did you make it into heaven right and the response was i, I don't exactly remember but one thing which um, which has been in my mind is that since your heaven and hell is going to be determined on the day of judgment, so how do you, when you dream something and somebody is in heaven, how do you even Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so the question was, a few weeks ago I mentioned a story where somebody saw <coughs> one of Imam Malik's uh, main students, Ibn al-Qasim, um, and I positioned the story by saying this is a, if we look at Imam Malik as being one of the reasons <coughs> or one of the men that Allah chose to preserve the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along with the other great Imams, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and so forth uh, and some of the other Imams that we don't have their madhabs anymore, Imam al-Layth al-Sa'di and, uh, and so forth. <coughs> Um, and Ibn al-Qasim was his main student, so somebody might think, oh, well, the, the thing that most benefited him was the knowledge and the teaching and so forth. And so after his passing, somebody said, you know, how, what did Allah do with you or how did you, you know, um, um, how did you find the next life? And so he said, um, what I found most benefit was just a few rak'ahs that I used to pray in the night. So it wasn't all of that public lectures and the teaching and the answering of questions and the fatwa and so forth. It was just a few rak'ahs of tahajjud. Uh, but the question specifically, and just and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if our, our position of heaven and hell is um, determined on the day of judgment, then how does a person know that at that point? Uh, which is a, it's a very good question. And so a, a few things that we have to keep in mind is that we can't take... Um, definite rulings from dreams. This is really a big one. And this is something that's really important in our lives. We have to have a connection with our dreams. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create things as a, as a joke. You know, Did you consider that we created you in jest, in abath? So dreams are definitely a part of our lives. Um, there's angels who are that are their specific jobs. They're entrusted with bringing visions from Allah al mahfuz to the person who sees that. So it's a very, um, it's a very important part of our lives. If we, that's the true dream. Dreams could also come from our nafs. It could also come from the shaitan. Could come from angels. It could come directly from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Not as revelation, but as what what they term as ilham. Um, but. Um, so it, it is important for us to, to recognize what we see in our dreams. The Prophet ﷺ very often after Fajr, he would actually ask the Sahaba, did any of you see any dreams? And I've personally brought this into my household at breakfast. I'll ask the kid, my kids, did you see any dreams? Most of the times, and this is what happens for most of us, the dreams we see are just the silly dreams of the nafs. You know, it's adghathu uh, ahlam, like it says in the Quran. Um, so when the king had the dream about the seven cows and the seven ears of corn and so forth. Um, some of the interpreters said, oh, this is just adghathu ahlam, and this is just the, those uh, jumbled up dreams that the nafs gives you. But when it was taken to Yusuf, he was able to, to explain it. 
So we have to be able to differentiate between what's from our nefs. Um, you know, our nefs can speak to us, can also speak to our fears. And then for, for those of us who are parents, or even if you're uncles or older brothers, asking people what they saw in their dreams, your kids, your nieces, your nephews, it, you can help getting an, an understanding of what they're dealing with, or maybe what, are, what their fears are, uh, or something that's uh, they're concerning them. I'm not saying that we're gonna do tafsir of the dreams, because only certain people can, can, can interpret dreams, but it is important even to have that conversation. Um, but at the same time, we can't take judgments from the dreams. So some people, sometimes they, they actually look to dreams to kind of guide them in their lives. And they want to say, okay, uh, I'm going to pray istikhara and then I'm going to wait for a dream. How many of you have heard that? How many of you, are, yeah, we've, there are people who wait for a dream. And that's not the way istikhara works. You could get a dream, but it's more of a feeling. But then there's people who will actually make life decisions based on a dream. And Yes, could that happen? It could, you know, uh, Allah could give a person a message in a dream or maybe the angels are giving them that person some direction. But at the same time, our primary source of deriving judgments is the Quran and Sunnah, is the Sharia. Um, and that's why if something in a dream negates uh, what's in the Sharia, then we have to give precedence to the Sharia. So I'll give you an example. It's kind of a funny example. Um, Ibn al-Hajj mentions this in, in the book uh, Al-Madkhal. He says a man had a, he found a treasure. And so if you find a treasure, does anybody happen to know what the zakat on treasure is? It's the khums, 20%. And you don't wait for a year to go out. You have to give it out immediately. And actually, I know somebody here in the Bay Area who did find a treasure in his house. So it does happen. He found a, a box of old German gold coins and so forth. So, you know, the, I know it's not like a here, you know, urban legend type of thing. It, it happened. Um, so if you find a treasure, uh, but that differs than if you, if, if you find it like in a Muslim country and you know it could be property of a Muslim, that has a different set of rules. That's like a lost property. So uh, if you find an old buried treasure, uh, there's 20% zakat that's due immediately. So this person in Morocco, he found, this is over 700 years old, this story. He found a treasure and in a dream, he saw the Prophet wasallam, who says, you don't have to pay the zakat. Now, if you see the Prophet وسلم, you know you saw him because the shaitan can actually take the form of any other, other, other person. He can even take the form of like a, a, a wali or a saint or a sheikh and come and then tell the person you should do this or you should do that. So that's why it's very important to, to understand the, the tricks of the shaitan. So, but the Prophet وسلم, that's for sure. If you see him, you know that's him. The shaitan can't take his form. So now this person sees the Prophet وسلم, saying, um, you don't have to pay zakat. So he went to some of the ulama and their response was, he said, well, the Prophet told me in a dream, sallallahu alayhi wa I don't have to pay zakat. He said, well, the Prophet told us in a wakened state that you do have to pay zakat because we have a hadith, you know. And, so, uh, and there's a very interesting discussion on that. What happens if you see the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa and he tells you something that actually goes against the, the, the sharia, right? So it doesn't mean that he's changing the sharia, but it means that he's, he's actually indicating to you some deficiency in your life. So that's why it's important to study the Shama'il. If we know what the Prophet looks like, if we know what the Prophet did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he uh, know how he acted, and then we see him in a dream and he does something other than that, it doesn't mean that he's changing the Sharia for us, it actually means that he's reflecting in us a deficiency in our application or understanding of the Sharia. And the reason is, is because there's a hadith that says the believer is like the mirror of his brother, right? Have we heard this hadith? The, he's like the, the, the mirror. Now, what is the most polished mirror that we can have in the ummah? It's the Prophet So he's showing us, like there's people who say, for example, um, whatever it might be, there, there's certain elements of his sunnah or his sharia that they've seen him not do in the dream. And so people say, well, how did the Prophet you know, not do that. And so it's a reflection of that person not being able to apply that in, the, in their life. Um, and so, so maybe this person, he didn't want to give out the zakat. Maybe he had some uh, miserliness. Maybe he had something in him and the Prophet said, oh, you don't have to give out zakat. Not saying we're changing the sharia. You don't want to give out the zakat. Something like that. But the, the reason why uh, Ibn al-Hajj was mentioning the story is he's saying, even if we see something in a dream, even if we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we still have to balance it out with the Sharia. 
So this is, I'm, I'm kind of contextualizing your question, which is a good question. We hear a story about Ibn al-Qasim, he makes this statement, now we're trying to balance out with the, 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 the Quran and Sunnah. Now according to our understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, yes, the judgment is, like, is becomes known at that point, but when did Allah know that people are going to go to hell and people are going to go to heaven? Even before they were born, right? Law is pre-eternal. And uh, now we're just kind of going through the process of, of, of finding our final, uh, our final state. And can people be given um, indications that they might be from the people of, of hell or uh, uh, of heaven? They could. But even if we see a dream, it's just we take it as a bushra, whether it's a dream or we see somebody in the dream, whatever, it's a glad tiding. But we're not gonna, we can't say for, for a fact that Ibn al-Qasim is in Jannah. We can't say that because that's not, as you said, it's not, gonna, it's not going to become um, yaqeen, 100% knowledge until Yom al-Qiyamah, until we all see it right now. So right now, who do we know for a fact is in the hellfire or is destined for the hellfire? Fir'aun. And there's some other characters, but let's just take Fir'aun. How do we know Fir'aun is in the hellfire or destined for the hellfire? Through the Qur'an. And that's why. So it, it has to be established by revelation. Dreams are not revelation. And so that's why even if we see, even if some people say, yes, this person, I know he's going to Jannah. We don't know that. This person for sure, he's going to the hellfire. You know, there's some times of, uh, you know, some uh, religious fanatics that will be like, oh, you know, point out somebody and say, you're going to hell. Well, how do you know that? Um, uh, Imam Noah, mentions that he said, we, c we cannot make a determination of heaven or hell for anybody because of the hadith. And once I'm, it's mentioned in the 40 hadith of Imam Noah, where he says, that a person will be from the people of Jannah for his whole life and then right before death when he's just a hand span or an arm's length away from Jannah, what happens? He does one of the actions of the people of fire and then he goes in. And then the opposite is true as well. Somebody lives their whole life as a, from the people of the hellfire and then when he's just a hand span or an arm's length away from the hellfire, he does something from the people of Jannah and that might be right before he passes away. So that's why, like we go to the maqbara over here, the, the cemetery, um, you know, the Muslim cemetery, but do we know that everybody there has actually died as a Muslim? We don't know. We can only judge based on the outward, but, we, but uh, ultimately we don't know. In a non-Muslim cemetery, could there be people there that are gonna end up in Jannah? Maybe, but we don't know. Maybe they became Muslim right before they died. So there's no definite, we can't give a definite ruling to anybody unless we have wahi. So even if we have a dream where somebody says, oh, I saw this person is in the hellfire. Okay, maybe that was from your nafs. Maybe that was from the shaitan. Maybe it was from Allah, who knows? But we cannot say definitely. So uh, I know I'm kind of expanding on the idea, but it is true. We see this story. I've actually, um, um, uh, you know, and then people say, what have you benefited afterwards? So I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, brother. When the prophets, uh, uh, prophets have had visions that so and so is in hellfire because of this reason, right. that is obviously true. But if that hasn't happened, how can you see that? So the way I finally, in a different context, somebody showed this trick to me, that if there are two points A and B on a paper, what's the shortest distance between them? Let's just say this diagram. And straight line. Straight yeah. line. And then I bend the paper and I say, now what? Mm -hmm. They are just together. It's not the straight line and the shortest distance. So in my opinion, I related it, and I want to check that, if that's a possible explanation, at least it satisfied me, is that time is unidirectional for all of us, but not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. He, he, he knows what, uh, what right. we're saying. He knows what's going to happen. And what has happened, he, what will happen, he can show the prophets. Yes, yeah, through revelation. So the, the, the it's, like, it's like what you have in control. It's just that time is, uh, you know, unbendable and unidirectional for us. And it's not for Allah. Right, and he's and so the you know, the, the question is about um, uh, you know time and how do we understand and how do we understand things that are going to like one of the stories that I mentioned too was about uh, somebody on Yom Al Qiyamah who 
they were destined for the hellfire and then they see their and, and one of the reasons why they're destined for the hellfire is because of their disrespect of their father and then as they're being led off to the hellfire they turn back and they see like oh my father's also being led to the hellfire for his sins and so he says well just take my good sins and give them i mean give them my good deeds and give them to my father and let at least let him go into jannah and then allah forgives them both so that's a, it's mentioned in the hadith it's a story that happens on yom al-qiyamah um, and it's it's it is go it has not happened yet, so it's not like that we're in an, an illusion. Time is a creation. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not bound by time, and that's something beyond our comprehension because we only know beginning, you know, and end. Something that has a beginning and an end. Allah has no beginning. He has no end. He's not bound by time. There is no yesterday, today, or tomorrow for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If you try to think about it and wrap your wrap your mind around it, it's incomprehensible. And once you realize, it's actually, and this is a very in, deep point of Tawheed, once we wrap our heads around that fact, that like if we, like just think about that, Allah is, he, He's not contained by any direction, by any place, by any time. He does not look like anything we can imagine. If you try to say, well, well then what is He? Exactly, now you understand Allah. And so that's why the Salaf would say, they have, there's many variations of this, um, 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 uh, like not being able to like realizing that you're not able to comprehend Allah now you've comprehended him not comprehended him but that's that's your tawheed the fact that we have to be able to say uh, uh, there's nothing there's no there's no thing like him time is a thing place is a thing direction is a thing Begin, you know all of those things uh, uh, color sight smell anger emotion anything we can comprehend is something and Allah is completely different than that yeah. so in the example that you just gave there's a so you mentioned that like, on the day of judgment the guy was going in Jahannam yeah. and he saw his father but I thought your, whatever you have done before you die is going to determine where you go you can't change it on the day of judgment Allah can do whatever He wants, yeah. Because there's also people who are going to be punished for a short time, but then He can uh, He can forgive them. Uh, there's also people who will be interceded. You know, they will get the intercessions. But that's different. That's Allah's forgiveness. He's very merciful. But this is His action on the day of judgment. Yeah. So He gives the action. He gives the judgment that He's He says this person is destined for the hellfire. Um, and they were destined for the hellfire, and then he and then he abrogated that by saying, "Now uh, I've forgiven you," because he can put a person into the hellfire and then take them out. And the person's action on based on his judgment could change the whole judgment. Okay, uh, but let me let me. Okay, I don't want to get too deep into. The, I'd make this a aqidah class because now we're getting into theology, which it sh which we should proceed it with a number of different conversations, and I think that would be good. And I, what I would mention as a point is that every one of us should go through a basic aqidah text. There's a book called uh, Aqidah at Tahawiya. There's a number of recordings online. Everybody just listen through those. And what I would say is some of these some of these discussion these questions would be very good. But after. Uh, going through a course like that. So Mufti Abdurrahman uh, Mangera has an online course, uh, but the Tahawiyah, T-A-H-A-W-I-Y-A, Tahawiyah. It's a very um, comprehensive course. Um, there's a number of different translations of it, so I would suggest that. They're, they're all very good questions, and, and this is actually brings up a good point that our kids, and those of you who have children know this, our kids ask us very, very, very deep theological questions all the time and it's not enough for us to be able to, to just say well let me wait and ask let me wait and ask let me wait and ask we each one of us should be at a very you know a deep understanding of aqidah to be able to say okay here's the point here's the point here's the point and if something is not specifically mentioned okay now let me ask the the the, the, the scholar uh, but that that text has a, a over 100 points and the majority of questions would be answered that. So that's what I would encourage everybody to just make a personal commitment. There's some online, uh, there's, a, there's, mashallah, I mean, there's so many online opportunities there that are, that are available, especially for those of us that have commutes, right? 
And so now you can just listen to them as you're, as you're commuting. It's not the optimum because you want to be able to be focused and take notes and so forth, but it's better than just, you know, worrying about the, so I would just, let's take that as an encouragement that to, to everybody to dedicate themselves, go through a course of Aqidah, the Tahawi is a very good course, and all these questions are really good, and maybe one day we'll organize a Aqidah intensive, you know, uh, and answer these questions, because the question that you asked about that, that's actually, let's call it an ishkad, like, how is a person's, because we know that your actions post-death do not change, and so this is one of the um, uh, you know, whenever we find a hadith or an ayah that um, doesn't match up with a general understood principle, this is the mutashabih. These are the ambiguous ayahs. And so the scholars have to tread lightly and say, okay, the Prophet said this, but we also know he also has this other, these other things that he said. How do we balance between them? And pointing out those, this is why it's important to have that solid foundation because children will ask those questions. You know, if you tell this story and a kid, but I thought, you know, and it's not enough to say, this is what we believe, you know, just, you want to be able to engage in those, question, in, in those questions, because if we just stifle it, stifle it, stifle it, by the time they go to college, now they're exposed to the world, and even before that with the phones, so we want to train them. In fact, one of the, and this is mentioned at the end of the text that we were studying, Bidr al-Walidain, one of the obligations of a father to their son is to give them a firm foundation in Tawheed a firm foundation in understanding that because then there's things that pop up in our lives that we have to be able to place them on the framework of our Tawheed. So if something comes up like, uh, say for example, you know, now there's all this discussion about LGBTQ and do we support them and how do we support them and all of those things. Now we need to be able to understand that through the lens of, a, of, of the, uh, the Aqidah, of the Tawheed, of, of the Muslims. How does this, you know, how do we view this? First of all, before we even talk about action, what is our belief about this, about the action, about the condoning, about supporting, about whatever it is? Let's just have that discussion. Uh, so that's why that, that's very important. But there was a question to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, on that 20% finding a treasure. Okay, yeah. You know, around in this area, a lot of people find new products. Products? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it becomes into a million dollar company or something. Yeah, so the, the question was, there's people who find new products and it becomes a, b a billion dollar company. This is specifically about, um, you know, uh, there, it brings up a good point. If we have something in the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that whoever finds a, 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 a treasure, he owes 20% of zakat on it. Um, we, ha we have to look at that as literal. He's talking about a treasure. Because if you find, uh, say, minerals... What's that? It's, well, it's specific. It is a, it's a human product that was buried. Gemstones, gold, whatever it might be. If it's an idea, like you make an invention or you have a business, there's another set of, of rules, which are the rules of zakat that, 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 are, that are applicable you know, to, to, to a business. We only have about 10 more minutes. I'll take one question, then I wanted to actually ask the audience uh, something. Any more questions? Wow. Yes. Uh, this is about what's happening now with the coronavirus. Oh, okay, yeah. And online, there are people with discussions. Like me as one of the river community members. There are questions like, oh, this is going to be a punishment for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, yeah, very good question, yeah. There are, there are scholars talking about it. So, but personally, I believe so. Based on some hadith. And, and, and what, we do, what we went through. But Okay, so the question was about the coronavirus and is it a, um, um, a, a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like how what we were talking about earlier when we say we can't determine whether or not somebody's in the hellfire or not because that's from ilm al ghaib it's from the unseen. So uh, the description of us right there at the beginning of the Quran, Alif Lamim, Dalik al Kitab, that's the book, La Raiba Fi, Hudan Lin Muttaqeen, Al Ladina, Yu'minuna bil ghaib. They believe in the unseen, right? We believe in the unseen. It's not that we know the unseen, right? We believe in it, but we don't, we don't claim to have knowledge of it. So for example, uh, there's a hadith that talk about every single one of us has at least two angels with us, but up to 400. Up to 400. When I read that, I said, subhanAllah, that's the hafadah, the protect, the guardian angels. And the more, the more we make our state better, the more angels we get. So there's the two angels, the scribes, they never leave us. And 
even if we're doing evil actions. Uh, unfortunately, they don't like, I mean, not unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, if we as human beings are doing evil actions, we're harming those angels, but they're assigned to us. They cannot remove us. But what they do do is if a person, especially if a person is a disbeliever, they'll, ask, they'll make dua that Allah hurries up and takes their life so that they can be dismissed of their duties for that person. But if a person is, 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 is in good, they'll make dua that Allah in, in long, elongate their life so that they can keep you know, being ascribed to this person who's, who's, who's doing good things. So they cannot leave us. But the extra angels that come for protections, they have the choice of being around us or not. They can come and, and, and if a person, you know, there's certain things that angels don't like and if that's being done and one of the main one is disobedience of Allah, they will leave that person's presence. So the more, the better, the more good that we're doing, the more angelic presence that we can have. But if somebody comes to me and says, you know what, you have 40 angels and you have 30 angels. And like, how do you know that? Could, is it possible that Allah could like remove the veil and allow the person to see that? Maybe, but we don't have to believe that. So whenever somebody makes a firm um, judgment about the unseen, we don't have to necessarily believe that. It could happen. It's a miracle. And it could happen, um, but we don't have to necessarily uh, believe it. So coming now to the adab, the, if something is sent as a adab, a punishment from Allah, who knows that? Like who can know that something is a adab, or maybe it's just a test. So for example, we see in the prophets, some of them were given very, very difficult tests. Think of the story of Ta'if. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we read that story, it, hurt, it hurts us, it pains us like, what they did and they called him names and threw stones until his feet bleed and kicked him out of the chased him out of the city i mean it's a it's a very hard thing to know that happened to our prophet would somebody say that's a adab no it's a test it's a musiba so we can say for sure that a, that an outbreak like that is a is a musiba is a tribulation but to say that it's specifically a punishment that's only allah knows that only Allah can say that. And this is very important because, especially when we deal with tribulations in our life, and I get this question a lot, you know, a person says, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with this, or whatever. Is this a punishment from Allah? Now, if a person tries to process a tribulation, a musiba, so a musiba means just, it's, it's a problem, something happened. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that you will get rewarded for your musiba, your tribulation, your problem, your test, even if it's the prick of a thorn, right? The prick of a thorn on up. And who are the people who get the most tri trials and tribulations? Prophets, right? And so that's not a, a that a person is being tribulated is not a, the sign that Allah does not like them. It's actually a sign that He does like them because what happens when a person is 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 filled? Their lives are filled with trials and tribulations. What do they? What does that person do if they have belief? They have a, a, a sabr, patience. They turn to Allah. They turn more to Allah. You know, so it actually increases their, and, and they call on Allah more. And sometimes Allah, He loves to hear the voice of that person. And so He will send tribulations their way just so He can see, hear that person's voice. So a tribulation is not, is not a sign of, of punishment. Now, but what happens if a person is now <clears throat> thinking, starts thinking, you know, they get and say, whatever it might be, a car accident. They get in a car accident, they're like, oh my goodness, is this a punishment from Allah? As opposed to, this is a musibah. You see the different like way of, you know, the prophets got tried, the prophets had tribulations, Ad and Thamud had a punishment. Which category are you? Now, if it's mentioned in the Quran, we know what happened to Ad, that was definitely a punishment. So we can't speak on the ghayb about anything. Um, and so that's why the coronavirus, you know, was it, you know, was it a punishment from Allah? Could it be? Sure. Could it also be a punishment because of something that somebody did on the other side of the world? Yeah. What does it say in the Quran? Fear a tribulation that will not affect only the oppressors. So the idea there is that if there's oppression in the land, Allah could send a fitna a punishment, and it, when it comes down, it just engulfs everybody, animals included. Um, and one of the Mufassiri, he mentioned something, and I took this to heart. He said, anybody who has a, a flock around them, 
right? We know in the hadith it says, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعَ Every one of you is a shepherd. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعْيَتِهِ Everyone will be asked about his flock. So if you're a father or a mother, your children. If you're a family, it might be your siblings. If you're taking care of parents, it's your parents. If you're a teacher, your students. If you're, if you're an employer, it's your employees. You know, everybody has people they're responsible for. And so what it says is, be careful of you, O people who are in positions of responsibility, parents, community leaders, teachers, employers, uh, whatever it might be. Because if you do something, what happens if the musibah comes down and it affects the other people? So it could affect people around you. So it's a, it's a reminder for us, you know, when we're at that fork in the road, when we could choose the good road or we could choose the evil road, we might say, okay, and you know, if I'm punished, I'll, I'll, I'll have sabr, you know, with it. I'll deal with the punishment. But what if, what if the punishment in the dunya comes down and it engulfs other people? So this is something, you know, that, and I think is also lost in the discussion, you know, everybody's talking about climate change and things are happening, you know, climate wise. And they're talking about fossil fuels and this and that and plastics and all this. Stuff. Nobody's talking about sins. What if it's the sins of Bani Adam? ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ Allah says in the Quran, Corrupt, fasad, corruption, which could include like climate change, has become apparent in the oceans, in the land and the oceans, what? بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ From what people's hands have done. So, nobody's talking about that, nobody wants to mention that, it's just, oh, it's, it's definitely fossil fuels. Well, that might be a sebab. A, a way that Allah made it uh, appear, but why aren't we talking about? Well, let's turn around and and um, uh, and this was the state of the of the of the early generations. If they saw a musibah, if they had a tribulation, the first thought they had was not let me figure it out with my mind or let me do something. It's let me go worship to Allah and make toba. And you see this consistently in many many stories where they will when, when something happens it says okay let me look back and see what have what am i doing or not doing spiritually so that we have that that spiritual co co connect, uh, connection so could the coronavirus you know be be adab maybe allah alam could it be adab that actually is you know somebody on earth did something and it just happened to fall down in um, uh, in that area could be. Uh, it's also uh, right next to a, um, a biological military lab. You know, could it be the fact that they're playing around with things and something got out? Yeah. And, and, and part of the facade is people are doing really, really foul and evil things, following the shaitan. All of the diseases of the heart are being, you know, implemented in an evil way. And then, and then the innocent, uh, the innocent are, are punished. Oh, yes, the older people, yes. They cannot pray. I, even I lost contact with my families. And only us know what we went through for the past yes. three years. Even at this time of age, I, we cannot even call over the phone. Yeah, that's... Uh, and, and definitely, like you said, I cannot claim it's from Allah, but... Is it, is it, yes, because of what, because of the oppression that they, like when we're looking at it, if we're saying if that country there has done so much oppression, both at the government level, the Chinese people uh, of the, the Uyghur Muslim uh, people, they've done so much oppression, and the other thing is maybe if the people weren't directly involved, but the citizens who, who stayed silent. Because this, the, the, this ayah that says, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خاصة, The Sahaba interpreted it as, because you have people who were oppressors, and the, uh, the Quran says, it will affect not only the people who, who did the act, and, and the tafsir of some of the Sahaba is, those who saw the oppression and were silent. So think of all of the people, the countries included, think of all of the Muslim countries included, that could have put diplomatic pressure on them, instead are giving them rewards for their humanitarian efforts and so forth. People who could have put economic uh, uh, pressure, but we still want our products, you know, that, that, that come from the country. We could do a lot, but people are just silent. So could it be for the fact, so this ayah talks about, it talks about the people who are directly implementing the oppression, but then also those people who know about it and are silent. And if you see any of those um, uh, uh, investigative documentary journals, they go up to people, just people in the streets, and do you know about what's going on? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. So we think that not talking about it is, oh, I'm not involved. But for the believer, we have to do something. So could it be, uh, I mean, if we were going to make a case for, 
you oppressed millions of Uyghur people in, in China. And now you get this, this thing. Could this very well be adab because of that thing? It, like, doesn't it look like everything's adding up? We can't say 100% sure, but we can definitely say, if it is, it's a pretty good case. You know. Their own people, yeah. Well, and even the doctor that came out there, you know, the doctor who reported it and because of the censorship and, you know, no freedom of... Uh, Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it should be a call to all of us to say, you know, what, are, what, what, what can we do? Um, and some things, you know, on a global level is very difficult. What can we make a change? Um, what I can say is that here locally, you know, we think globally, act locally. Our sphere's concern is, is, is very big, whatever we, but our, we have to look at our sphere of influence. So actually what I wanted to end, next week we don't have uh, the, the halaqa. There's no, uh, the boys and the girls halaqa is not here. Uh, but one thing that, one of the intentions of this men's halaqa uh, was also to serve the community, but also um, uh, to look for people who want to be mentors and counselors to the youth in our community. So one of the things on the sister side, alhamdulillah, there's a lot of women who are involved. There are a lot of teenagers who are involved. But on the boys' side, we really struggle. And I'm not talking about just this community. I'm talking about communities all over the place. And I'll share with, some, so, uh, share you, um, share with you something. A few weeks ago, I went to Houston, and there was a sister who um, she was saying, when she was at the masjid, she, um, she was a single mother. She had two children. And she would approach people at the masjid saying, I need a mentor for my boys. Like she is the mother, but she wants a mentor for her boys. And the suggestion that was always given to her, well, why don't you marry somebody? She said, I'm not in a position, I don't, I'm not looking to get married, and I don't think that's the solution. And I would just want the masjid to, you know, the masjid community to, 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 to build up this mentorship. Have you, has everybody heard of like the Big Brother program? So there's a national program of the Big Brother. That's something we would like to have here at this community. It should be in a lot of masajid. Um, so whether a person's interested in being a, uh, a counselor here uh, for the boys program, I know some of you may be involved in the Sunday school program. You know, the involvement of men is very important. Um, and so I would just say, just get involved. Uh, if you're a father, you're already involved in your children, but if you have time, or if you know people who maybe are not as busy with their own children and their work, and they have time, uh, the ability to be a mentor, uh, please uh, reach out to me, but either by email or in person, um, and I can, uh, it's rami at mcceastbay.org, and just share, you know, let me know that if you want to be um, a mentor or a counselor for our programs here, or even on an individual basis, but it's something we would like to, to, to get established, and, and moving to where it's a uh, it's part and parcel of the way the masjid runs. So one of the things that you know, if you hear of a masjid anywhere, if they start if they start up, you know they're going to have a Jum'a prayer, you know there's going to be Tarawih prayer, and most probably a Sunday school. Those are kind of like the bread and butter elements of a masjid. But the other elements of the masjid that we should also have is this connection to where we have that mentorship, where people who are not only interested in doing it but they're also trained they go through some basic training and then they can serve the needs in the community because i know for a fact and this every muslim community needs it and i know for, for a fact from you know reach being reaching out to people in the community there is a need so if you are interested or if you know somebody who's interested please reach out to me inshallah yeah maybe and if you have to leave because i know it's nine yeah. to pick up the kids but what i'm here for you Ah, uh, very good question, yeah. So, so do I even qualify? Because I can help boys with their career thing, what they're thinking of, but if they have Islam or Quran related questions, I'm not the best person. Yeah. Like, is it the right? Thank you for asking that. That's a very question. So the question to everybody here is it? like, if I, if I don't know that much about uh, Islamic, if I don't have that much Islamic knowledge, can I still be a mentor? There's other things that I can do, maybe mentor in professional capacity and so forth. And it's an excellent question. And it's actually a big hesitation on why people don't take these positions, whether it's a Sunday school Islamic teacher uh, or a, a mentorship or a counselor. And what I would say is that, first of all, yes, Maybe not everybody is a scholar or have a, a serious student of knowledge, but we all have something to give. We all have something to give. And the Prophet ﷺ said, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةِ You know, convey from me even if it's one verse. 
um, so that's one thing that even if we have something, you know, we can we can convey. The other thing is a lot of our Islamic knowledge is embodied in who we are. So maybe we can't articulate, we can't give you, but if somebody were to say, you know, um, you know, I got caught cheating on a test. You know, maybe you can't re reference the exact verse and hadith and Islamic ruling, but you have, you know, that's wrong. And let me explain why it's wrong. And you can, you can convey the message of Islam without, you know, without having the details on some of the more general things. If somebody asks a very pointed, specific fiqh question, aqidah, theolo theology question, yeah, you want to be able to defer that. But a lot of what is in, is in mentorship is just reinforcing basic uh, things um, that, uh, that, that every one of us already know that's a part of our Islam. And it's also, and I'll mention this again, it's also just showing the care that you care for them. That people come and they can see that there's care for, you know, people care about me. And I don't know if I, I think I may have mentioned it here, but I'll repeat it. There was a, a researcher who, she was researching about education and she said she wanted to find the magic bullet. Did I talk about that? Uh, okay, so she said, you know, people look for the magic bullet of what's that one thing that we could do that if we, that if we implement it in our schools and our educational programs, it would just make a huge difference. Is it testing? Is it tutoring? Is it after school programs? Is it higher level training of teachers? Is it training, you know, what is it? So in education, they're looking for the magic bullet. In, you know, in business, they're all, you know, come to my seminar and I'll tell you how to make a million dollars, all of that stuff. But in education, they're also looking for, in parenting, they're looking. She was looking specifically in, in education. So then she looks, you know, they do a meta-analysis of all these different studies, look at who's succeeding, and then try to isolate those those factors that have a strong correlation that if they're there you know you're never going to get a one-to-one -one correlation or very rarely but it's a pretty high indicator you know 0 0.4 0 0.5 0 0.6 correlation of that this actually affects that so what she settled on at the end of the day it's not the type of school it's not private versus public it's not the parents level of education because that's always mentioned it's not uniforms it's not all of these things that mention it said is not that it's the fact that the teacher cares for the student they care for the student so if the teacher shows that care yes what you oh wow okay are you you a teacher okay mm. Oh, okay, did everybody hear that? So he, uh, Abdul Haq is a, is a teacher and he said that, that what they try to tell other teachers and teachers is that students won't care what you know until they know that you care. And it's the uh, same thing for as, as parents, you know, the parents, we have to show, sometimes we have to tell them that we care, but it's also about showing that you care. Uh, and there was another study that was done, this person wanted to find what was the, the, the changing moment in the lives of some of the great luminaries so he looked at lives of like Benjamin Franklin, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, a lot of other people, the secular, just look at, at biographies of people. And so he said he found every one of them around between 10 to 12 years old had it somebody in their life that showed that care. He said, that's the one thing I could find about all of them. They all had between 20 and 10 and 12. And he said it might have been just somebody, the bus driver. So not even like a lot, but it's, you know, pat on the shoulder. Hey, kid, you can do it. And that one instance of, hey kid, you can do it, was enough you know, to carry them through, through life. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because, say you have a scholar who has all of the answers, but they don't have that element of care, and then you have one person who maybe doesn't have all the academic answers, but can either help find it or you know, reference, but they just care, who's gonna have more impact on that person's life? And so now when we're talking about, you know, if somebody comes to the masjid, and so even if you don't go into the, 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 the you know, the capacity of like a, a counselor, just think about it. Every single interaction that you have with another person, especially children, especially at the masjid, they're already going through a lot of questions of identity and what am I am, who am I, and, and people are tugging at them, this is what you should be as a Muslim, whatever it might be. They come to the masjid, you show that you care, they're going to make that association, oh, that Muslim, at that Muslim place, cares about me because I'm Muslim, therefore Islam is great. But if we sit down and we say, this are, here's all the, you know, the logical reasons why Islam is right. Here's all the logical reasons why you should be Muslim. Here, but then, 
I don't. Sh they, we're not showing that we care. So that's what I would say. That you know, everyone. If, if as long as we have the capacity to care, you have the capacity. You know, capacity to help out other people. So now we have to to, to go. Jazakum Allah khair. There's no halaqa next week, but we'll pick up the week after.